Okay. So thank you, uh, Maidel, uh, for this uh, kind introduction. Let me share my screen. Still have issues with sharing the screen, but maybe if I put it. Can you all see my slides? Yeah, I can, yeah, I can see the slides. Okay, excellent. So thank you very much for the introduction. And indeed, today I would like to focus on light induced moderations in vitality and sleep, and actually also the impact of vitality and sleep on light exposure patterns. And as you might know, sleep problems are rather prevalent in the current society as our lack of vitality and challenges related to light hygiene. So, for example, persons spend a lot of time indoors. They also use light emitting screens in the evening, which may have implications for everyday functions like vitality, but also sleep. The overview of my talk is that I would like to start with a short introduction, introducing the topic. Then I would like to also briefly discuss a set of laboratory studies that we have recently performed investigating the temporal trajectories of light induced responses in terms of visual experiences and neurobehavioral responses. And followed by a discussion of field assessments investigating time lagged uh, relations between light exposure profiles, vitality, and behavior with a strong focus on sleep. As you might all know, light can have a widespread effect on our everyday functioning. It can influence how we see, how we behave, how we feel, how we think. Um, and it is well known that light can have an influence on the visual system, so via image forming processes, but light may also influence our everyday functioning via non-image forming processes, as we have also seen in earlier lectures within the seminar. Um, so there are two pathways or often the effects of light are classified according to those two pathways. On the one hand, we have the image forming pathway, which uh, might also be the most well known pathway through which light can influence how well we can see the environment, enables us to see colors, contrast objects in the environment. It may also induce visual experiences in terms of pleasantness of the environment. Uh, it may uh, steer us in a specific direction, uh, focus our attention to specific elements in the environment. And on the other hand, light can influence our everyday functioning via image form, non-image forming processes, like the effects of light on our circadian system, by which the timing of physiological and psychological processes are influenced. It can have also more instantaneous effects on how we feel, behave, and think. And I think it's important to mention that those processes are not independent of each other and often interact. And also when being exposed to light, both processes may be activated at the same time. So we have discussed the non-visual effects via circadian processes quite substantially already, um, but light can also induce more acute neurobehavioral effects. And that means that it can induce instantaneous changes in our subjective momentary state in terms of sleepiness, level of vitality, uh, how we feel in terms of our mood. It can also induce changes in our behavior in terms of how well we can sustain attention to specific stimuli in the environment, how well we can perform on cognitive demanding tasks, 
It may also moderate our uh, physiology in terms of hormone secretion, brain activity, uh, as well as autonomic uh, nervous activity. So this mainly refers to situations where light masks the expression of the biological clock. And there are different study paradigms that can be used in order to assess those acute effects. On the one hand, you have the controlled confines of the laboratory in which you can investigate the influence of a specific light parameter under very well controlled conditions. And then this can be run in parallel or complementary to field assessments where the behavior and affective state of persons is monitored during their daily life in the everyday dynamics of their daily life, which is highly fluctuating and not constant as the laboratory often is. So in this presentation, I would like to demonstrate a few examples uh, of the use of laboratory studies as well as field assessment in order to study effects of light on vitality, amongst others. And this was inspired by the recent adoption and development of the dynamic, dynamic lighting systems, which can be defined as artificial lighting that is variable in its intensity and spectral power distribution over time using preset lighting conditions resulting in modified activation of at least one of the photoreceptors over a substantial part of the day. You may recognize this definition as it was also part of the reading materials that was sent along with this um, for this uh, presentation. And the reason that we specified modified activation of at least one of the photoreceptors is that you may be blind to specific modulations in light if we think, for example, about mesomeric lighting. So that's why we thought it's important to specify it in terms of photoreceptors instead of illuminance and spectral composition, uh, or at least CCT, as has often been done. And there are different motivations in order to use dynamic lighting. So first of all, dynamic lighting can support our circadian entrainment. So it can provide well-timed light and serve as a time cue for our biological clock. It can also acutely provide support at specific times of day in order to, for example, um, increase alertness, to benefit vitality, to induce mood, uh, or to support specific tasks such as reading, uh, performing a complex mathematical task or relaxation. Uh, another uh, potential motivation to use dynamic lighting is to provide fascinations and or in informative environments. Um, often this is uh, reflected in the mimicking of daylight uh, or at least natural elements um, in order to provide a positive user experience in order to induce fascination, uh, but it can also serve as a time cue, for example, the time of day or give insights in weather conditions. And given the urgency um, and the relevance of climate change, also a potential motivation of using dynamic lighting is energy saving in the sense that you only provide light at the time that is needed in order to save energy. Uh, so there can be multiple reasons. There are also multiple reasons acknowledged in earlier studies investigating dynamic lighting. Sometimes they directly were reflected in the used light scenarios. But sometimes they were not explicitly mentioned or there was no clear mapping between the rationale and the used lighting scenario or the tested lighting scenario. And if we look at the different methodologies, we see that there were quite some different protocols used in the studies that we included in this um, systematic literature review. Now, in total, 14 students were included. And when inspecting the employed lighting scenarios, we saw substantial variations in the um, variations throughout the day in the used levels. 
Um, some used boost during the day with multiple peaks throughout the day. Some were more curvy, uh, following a specific curve and more gradual variations in the actual uh, light exposure pattern that was uh, installed. Uh, and in, uh, on the slide, you can see a few examples of the type of scenarios that have been used. And in addition to the variance type of scenarios that have been used, we also see many different rationales for installing dynamic lighting and for choosing a specific lighting scenario. And several of them were mentioned also on the previous slide. Also, the type of study designs varied substantially, uh, ranging from within to between subject design. Also, mixed study design were used. Um, and the measurement periods and the uh, type of measurements varied also substantially. So sometimes focus was on day-to-day -day fluctuations, sometimes assessments were performed on a more monthly basis. Um, so the um, temporal uh, resolution of the assessments varied substantially, which may have implications for detecting or not detecting uh, results. And if we look at the results, we see overall rather mixed findings with in general, the most promising results for tuning light exposure patterns during the day in order to foster sleep during the night. But there were also some indications for improvements in alertness and vitality and mood. And sometimes also came um, along with decrements in visual experiences, so a less pleasant environment. So if we look at the current literature, there are many unknowns related to the impact of light um, transitions on human functioning. First of all, related to the onset of effects, uh, so whether they occur immediately after changes in light settings or whether they are more delayed. It may also depend on the measurement employed. Persistence of the effects, whether they are persistent or more transient. And in terms of symmetry, if you increase or decrease the light, it's rather unknown whether this gives a uh, similar magnitude but opposite uh, responses or whether one direction shows more pronounced modulations in, for example, sleepiness or sleep as compared to another transition. And insights in the onset persistence and symmetry are very informative for the development of dynamic lighting, but might also shed light on the underlying processes related to the effects of light on our everyday functioning. So inspired, oh, sorry. Inspired by the um, findings obtained in this literature overview, we noticed that uh, results were rather mixed. We also noticed that many different light settings were used and compared uh, with not a systematic overview across studies. And therefore, we wanted to investigate uh, the most basic feature of a dynamic light pattern, which is a temporal transition. And we thought of the most basic transition, which is a stepwise transition, so just an increase or a decrease in light intensity, and see what the implications are of that, and particularly on the temporal response trajectories of both image forming and non-image forming related markers. So we performed a laboratory study to investigate the temporal trajectories of alertness, attention, arousal, and comfort after light transitions. And in order to do so, we used the within subjects design with a total of 38 participants. Um, so they were exposed to multiple conditions. And we had two light conditions uh, that we contrasted in this study, and they were uh, made in such a manner that they induce substantial changes both in image forming and non-image forming processes, or I should say in photopic and melanoptic activation. And in order to study the effect of the um, abrupt transitions, uh, the stepwise transitions, we used a multi-measure approach. And the procedure looked like this. So we started with an um, an, a baseline phase during which participants were either exposed to warm dim light or to cool bright light. 
for 90 minutes or 45 minutes, I'm sorry. Um, and at the end of this 45 minutes, so after 30 minutes, they were performing baseline measurements, starting with a short questionnaire, probing their affective state, uh, comfort ratings, and their experiences with the uh, brightness and the color of the light. Afterwards, they engaged in um, a PVT, a psychomotor vigilance task, to probe their level of vigilance. And they had the opportunity to read in between the set of questionnaires and uh, performance tasks because these blocks were repeatedly administered to get a better understanding of the temporal trajectory of the responses. After this initial state, participants were exposed to either cool, bright light or warm dim light. Um, so we designed the study in such a way that we had transitions both uh, from warm dim to cool bright, as well as the other way around. And we had constant light conditions where participants were continually exposed to warm dim light or to cool bright light throughout the 19 minutes experimental sessions. We had continuous physiological measurements and each session took 90 minutes and were scheduled at the same time of day and uh, participants came to the lab at four different days, but then at the same time. So if we look at the results, first of all, the results of these subjective measures, then we see that subjective sleepiness was lower when participants were exposed to the cool bright light after the transition uh, from warm dim light to cool bright light. And they were also experiencing higher feelings of vitality when they were exposed to the cool bright light after a transition from uh, warm dim light. We didn't see any modulations or significant modulations in sleepiness or vitality when we looked at the other way around. So when participants were first exposed to cool bright light and subsequently exposed to warm dim light or remained in cool bright light. We also did see an immediate uh, but transient effect of the um, changes in the light condition um, for the feelings of calmness. So mainly in the first assessment, we after the transition, we noticed that participants felt less calm when being exposed to the cool bright light as compared to the dim light, dim uh, warm light. And this uh, effect seemed to be more symmetric as in contrast to the uh, findings for sleepiness and vitality. We didn't see any significant effects for the performance indicators nor the ECG markers that we investigated. We did see an effect of the light condition um, on skin conductors level with um, increased skin conductors level when participants were exposed to continuous cool bright light. Then if we look at the effects for visual experience, so participants were asked to rate the brightness to evaluate the color of the light and to also indicate their acceptance with the light settings as well as the comfort, uh, so rating their visual comfort. So if we look at the sensation of the lighting, we see that participants rated the lighting as more intense in the cool bright light as you would expect and the reverse pattern was shown for the other transition. Um, participants also noticed the differences in color temperature that we induced. And here we also see symmetry in the responses. So the magnitude of the differences was rather similar, independent of the direction of the uh, transition. If we look at the results for uh, visual comfort, we see a different pattern. So we saw immediate modulations in visual comfort as a function of the light condition after being exposed to a dim uh, warm light condition. So then what participants were exposed to cool bright light after dim warm light, they uh, experienced lower visual comfort. And this remains uh, mainly up to the second. Uh, measurement block, although the main effect was also significant. We didn't see any uh, significant differences uh, when we looked at the other direction. So when participants experienced the transition from cool bright light to warm dim light. So you can see those differences 
over here showing very different response patterns dependent on the transition. So it seems that it's not the transition, but also the direction of transition is important. So overall in this uh, study, we mainly saw changes in the subjective experiences as a function of exposure to cool bright lights as compared to warm dim light and mainly for transitions. And then we performed a second study because in the previous study, we both manipulated the illuminance as well as the color temperature. Um, so we had two uh, very uh, stark contrasting conditions. Um, and in this next study, we also wanted to disentangle the effect of illuminance and color temperature and see their potential interaction effects. So we performed a second uh, laboratory study also using a within subject design with a slightly smaller sample size, uh, 23 participants participated in this study. We had four contrasting light conditions. Um, the baseline periods remained similar in terms of the light settings. Uh, participants all noticed a transition except for uh, the constant warm dim light condition. And again, we used a multi-measure approach. So the procedure was rather similar as compared to the previous study, only the light settings differed in the sense that we had cool bright light, cool dim light, warm bright light, and a cool, uh, sorry, warm dim light. So again, we monitored the response trajectories in terms of visual experiences and neurobehavioral uh, responses. And if we look at the results, we noticed that Vitality and uh, sleepiness responded to a transition in illuminance. As you can also see here on the slide, uh, their uh, feelings of vitalities were higher and their uh, sleepiness was lower when they ex were exposed to bright versus dim light. When looking at uh, visual comfort, acceptance and mood, we saw mainly modulations as a function of the uh, CCT, so the correlated color temperature. Visual sensation responded to both illuminance and CCT, and we didn't see any significant differences in the physiological or performance indicators that were employed in the current study. So overall, those findings showed very similar patterns as we have noticed in the previous study, except that we were able to disentangle the effect of intensity and uh, CCT or illuminance and CCT. We also investigated potential inter-individual differences in responses, and we mainly noticed those inter-individual differences for visual comfort. So only the random slope for visual comfort was significant when we inspected the effect of illuminance, but we didn't see the same pattern when we looked at CCT. So overall, participants experienced lower visual comfort when they were exposed to cool, uh, light as compared to warm light, so to high versus low CCT levels. But when we look at the impact of illuminance on visual comfort, we saw rather uh, differences. Uh, we, we saw quite substantial differences in their responses, um, showing that some persons liked or at least rated their visual comfort higher uh, when being exposed to the more bright versus dim condition, while others. Uh, reported lower visible comfort when being exposed to bright versus dim, as you can see in these figures. So overall, we saw quite some different response trajectories after an abrupt decision, transition in lighting for subjective experiences and the objective uh, measures. Most of the variables that responded to the light manipulation represented the subjective experiences. And in general, we saw immediately a response after the transition, or at least within a few minutes. And if uh, and where effects of the light transitions towards cool bright light or bright light solely or emerged, they were generally um, inducing higher alertness, uh, higher fatality, uh, but often also experienced as less comfortable. So these results may have implications for theory, um, given the fact that we see quite a complex picture when we look at all the different response trajectories 
This may question the dichotomous classification of image forming and non image forming pathway in the sense that when looking at visual experiences, we see that the visual sensation responds rather different than visual comfort. And also when we look at the non image forming pathway in the acute effects, we see modulations in vitality and analysis, but not so much in uh, performance or physiological parameters. So this also challenges um, the general made distinction, or at least the use of this distinction in order to translate findings from one parameter to another. And also in terms of study designs, there are implications for the measurement resolution, as we notice that some of the effects are rather transient. The choice of the measurement um, resolution may have implications on being able to detect or not detect changes in uh, the parameter of interest. And what this study also highlights is that an integrative lighting perspective is rather important, given the fact that we saw alerting and activating effects uh, when being exposed to bright, cool light. But this often didn't co-occur with a high visual comfort. And actually, the effects of the light condition on visual comfort were most, pronoun most pronounced. So it's very important to also take visual comfort into account when studying the acute effects of light on uh, neurobehavioral responses. So just wanted to show these studies as an illustration of experimental designs that can be used in order to study the temporal profiles of responses to light and to get a better understanding of the impact, the effects of light on uh, our everyday functioning. So in those situations, we can uh, control all other potential variables or most of the other variables that might also influence uh, alertness and vitality, uh, visual comfort, et cetera, by keeping conditions as constant as possible. Yet in order to translate those findings into everyday practice to the daily dynamics in the field, field assessments are also required. And they may inform also about potential patterns in responses that may be verified in the laboratory given the low internal um, validity of studies that are obtained in the field because we cannot control for all varying factors. We cannot measure everything in the field. So that brings me to the part on field assessments, where I would like to focus on the relation between uh, actual light exposure profiles, feelings of vitality, and sleep in the field. And in order to study the interrelation between those three constructs, we used ecological momentary assessments. And I'm not sure whether you're all familiar with ecological momentary assessment. So I thought maybe it's nice to include a few slides to explain this methodology. So ecological momentary assessment refers to the measurement of behavior, physiology and or environmental features in the natural flow and context of daily life using sensors and uh, self reports. And the, the protocol is used in order to capture life, life as it is lived to get a better understanding how life is lived, how uh, variables in our everyday life are interacting with each other, and also how we can uh, improve or um, induce specific interventions in order to promote a healthier life. Um, Subcategory of ecological momentary assessment is experience sampling methodology. And this refers to repeated questionnaires that are administered during the day in order to capture a representative sample of the moments in people's lives and to capture their momentary um, affective state, how they think, how they feel, how they evaluate the environment, depending on the um, research question. And the idea is that you can capture those states or evaluations at different times and across different situations 
which may provide a fine-grained and detailed picture of the uh, human experiences and behaviors. So you're not taking one snapshot, but you take many snapshots throughout the day in order to collect a representative indication of how people feel, how they behave, uh, which context they are, how they appreciate or not appreciate their context, etc. And this method nicely aligns with the dimensions as proposed by Kettle. Um, so he proposed a Kettle data box, which indicates that there are multiple dimensions across you can measure and collect data. On the one hand, you can collect data across persons, across time, and across variables. And using experience sampling methodology, you actually collect data across all those three dimensions. So intensive longitudinal data is collected across a large number of participants, taking many snapshots in their daily life, and often multiple variables are assessed in order to get a good representation of how life is lived and how specific variables vary over time and interact with each other. And the nice thing of this methodology is that you are able to make a distinction between, uh, between subjects and within subjects variances and to explore relationships within as well as between persons. And the reason to do so is that in general, the average person does not exist. And differences between groups may not necessarily be informative for one specific individual. And moreover, uh, if differences between groups are not reflected in differences within an individual, you might see a masking of those inter-individual differences for within subjects variations. So often it's good to make this distinction and um, let me illustrate this by means of an example. So let's assume the relation between typing speed and the amount of mistakes made. Generally you see or might expect based on your own experiences that with a higher typing speed, you make more mistakes. However, if we look at a between person level, then you generally see that those who have a high typing speed make fewer mistakes because they are more advanced in terms of their typing uh, skills. So then the between subject correlation would show a significantly different pattern. It would demonstrate a negative correlation. And hence, this might have masked or uh, level out the uh, relations. So you may have drawn very different conclusions depending on whether you assess this at an individual or at a group level. So in our field studies, we used the experience sampling methodology combined with sensor data with a light sensor to monitor the reciprocal relation between light and vitality. So in the paper by in, from 2013, we assess to what extent eliminance correlates with feelings of vitality in healthy day active persons during their daily routine. And for this presentation, I extended the analysis by integrating uh, data from an additional year. Uh, moreover, uh, I make a distinction for the within and the between subjects variation and also looked at the uh, bi-directional relationship. So not only to what extent eliminants can predict feelings of fertility, but also to what extent feelings of fertility may change the amount of light we are exposed to in the next hour. So as I said, uh, for experience sampling methodologies, you often administer repeated questionnaires throughout the day. And our notification policy uh, was as following. We sent notifications between 8 a.m. and 8 p.m. And participants received those notifications as fixed times, um, 12 times a day. And all participants participated for three consecutive days. And in addition to those short questionnaires probing their affective state, we also had a sleep diary uh, aimed to uh, quantify uh, the rest activity patterns, uh, um, sleep duration and sleep quality of the participants. 
So they also completed this diary in the morning. First, I uh, wanted to show you the temporal uh, profiles of hourly eliminance, uh, which was uh, log transformed, and feelings of vitality. So on the left-hand side of this um, slide, you can see the relation between eliminance as a function of time of day, so local clock time, and on the right-hand side, you see the variation in feelings of vitality as a function of local clock time. When we uh, predicted those levels as a function of time of day, we saw a curvilinear function, which could be best described by a third-degree polynomial. So there were structural uh, time of day dependent moderations in both eliminance and vitality, and I think this is also what you would expect. Um, so, because we saw those temporal patterns, so these time profiles in both eliminance and vitality, we first detrended the data. So, we looked at the residuals of the um, eliminance scores and vitality after accounting for the effect of time of day, which was modeled as a third degree polynomial. Then we inspected the autoregressive parameters in order to see to what extent uh, the prior light exposure, so light exposure during the prior hour, had an influence on the light exposure during the next hour. And what we did in this case, we centered the data. So we looked at the deviation of person's light exposure compared to their average light exposure, which was assumed to reflect a habit of light exposure, but it's questionable because we only measured for three days to what extent this is representative of their habit of light exposure. So what we saw is that when participants were exposed to more light than their average light exposure throughout the three sampling days, they were also exposed to more light in the next hour. And there was a subtle autoregressive parameter coefficient. So we saw that there was some variation uh, that can be, could be explained by prior light exposure. And we saw a similar pattern for vitality. So when participants felt more vital as compared to their average in the previous hour, they also reported higher feelings of vitality in the next hour. And again, this would be best described by a small autoregressive parameter. And then we performed time lag relationships. So we investigated time lag relationships between light and vitality in order to answer the main research question. So on the one hand, we looked at the extent to which light exposure average over the prior hour before completing the questionnaire was a significant predictor for feelings of vitality at the end of that hour. And what we saw is that within subject variations in hourly mean eliminance were significantly correlated with vitality at the end of the hour, meaning that when participants were exposed to more light than their average light intensity that they experienced throughout the three sampling days, they also reported higher feelings of vitality. And we also saw the reverse pattern. So we also performed uh, statistical models where we used vitality as a predictor for subsequent light exposure. So vitality at the start of the hourly interval as a predictor for the subsequent light exposure, mean light exposure. And again, we saw a positive relation, meaning that when participants felt more volatile than their average, they also uh, were exposed to more and more intense lights during the next hour. We only saw those relationships at the within subjects level. We didn't see any significant between subjects uh, variations and correlations. Um, Moreover, we didn't see uh, significant random slopes, meaning that there were no systematic variations in the relational strength between those two parameters, so between light exposure and feelings of vitality across participants. So overall, we noticed that participants felt more energetic when they were exposed to more intense light during the hour before completing the questionnaire. 
Moreover, there were also indications that participants saw more light when they felt more energetic. But it's also important to note that the associations were small. And I think this also corresponds to the uh, effect sizes that have been reported for laboratory studies, as well as also null findings that have been reported for laboratory studies, as well as field studies. So we saw this bidirectional relationship between light exposure and feelings of vitality. In a subsequent step, we also looked to what extent sleep induced modulations in light exposure during the subsequent day. When looking at the fixed effect, we noticed that there was no significant association between sleep duration and sleep quality during the prior night on uh, and a light exposure during the following day. Yes, when inspecting the random slopes, we did see significant uh, inter-individual variations in the relation between sleep duration and subsequent light exposure profiles. And we saw this for both sleep duration and sleep quality, meaning that there are substantial differences in the sense that some persons that slept well might be exposed to more light, while others show a reverse pattern where they might um, not seek more light and may stay indoors more uh, when they slept short. Uh, and the same applied for sleep quality. So we mainly notice substantial inter-individual differences in those relationships and the predictions of sleep on subsequent light exposure. And we also performed the same models for vitality. And there you also saw that on average, vitality was moderated by sleep duration and sleep quality, meaning that uh, sleep of vitality was higher when participants slept longer and when they experienced a better sleep quality. Also here, the random slopes were significant, again, illustrating substantial inter-individual differences in those relationships. So regarding sleep, we see substantial inter-individual differences in the predictive strength of sleep on light, but also on vitality. So we were able to show reciprocal uh, relationships between light and vitality. We also disentangled the within and the between subject variances, uh, which might be important to inform the design of lined interventions to see to what extent this should be performed within persons or whether uh, specific persons should be par particularly targeted in order to uh, promote a healthier light regime and to facilitate uh, vitality. Um, so, Given the relatively short sample period of three days um, and a total of 83 participants, we were not able or at least didn't have sufficient statistical power to also determine the impact um, of light exposure patterns on sleep. But there is a recent study by Estefan and colleagues which did also show bidirectional relationship between light exposure and sleep using um, actigraphy combined with light sensors worn at the wrist. So I think one of the major limitations of the current study is that we had only three sampling days and we monitored only between 8 a.m. and 8 p.m. And as most of you know, also the light in the evening or maybe particularly the light in the evening may play an important role in the regulation of sleep. So this would require a 24 hour perspective and it would be really nice if those results are replicated using the um, monitoring of light exposure patterns during the complete wake episodes and maybe even also during sleep. Participants were wearing the light sensors by means of a pair of glasses or mount, um, mounted on a pair of glasses or on a headband and this may have induced reactivity in the sense that participants may have adjusted their behavior due to wearing of the sensors. And some thought that it uh, looked like a camera, so uh, they may have hidden themselves a little bit more in their rooms uh, as we would have hoped to. So in general, also see that the light intensity and the levels were rather low to which participants were exposed, particularly 
substantially lower than the um, reasons recommendations by Brown and colleagues. So it would be really nice if future studies could adopt a longer sample period using a 24 hour perspective and given the relatively homogeneous sample that we uh, included in the current study, maybe a larger but also particularly a more heterogeneous sample could inform us even more about the inter individual differences and the random slopes for the relation between light and vitality. So this study showed clear temporal dependencies of the relation between light and vitality, uh, although the relations were subtle. And we didn't investigate any potential cumulative effects, which also might be nice to uh, study and have implications for everyday practice. So what we have seen is that the Differences in light exposure within days, within participants, may have implications for their feelings of vitality. And if we look at actual light exposure, these are highly dynamic. Um, and here I have just an illustration of light exposure patterns um, obtained among employees uh, for three consecutive weeks. And they were working in an office in which we set different uh, light settings. Um, so um, the electric lighting was adjusted during the three week period with different uh, scenarios per week. And what we mainly noticed uh, based on those recordings of actual light exposure patterns also monitored close to the eye because we were mainly interested in the amount of light close to the retina or falling at the retina as an approximation of light at the retina, um, we noticed that the uh, variation was rather substantial. And we saw substantial variation in light exposure across participants, but also across days within participants. And also within days, we saw substantial variations, as you can also see in the heat maps uh, displayed on this slide. Um, so the um, intensity of the color also displays the uh, intensity exp uh, experienced by the participants with the lighter yellow colors showing more bright light exposures as compared to the darker yellow colors. And here you just see a few examples of a relatively stable light exposure pattern, but also very diverse light exposure pattern um, for different participants. So this also shows that our light exposure patterns is strongly determined by our behavior and uh, our location within an office. So even though setting the same light intensity may not render similar light exposure patterns across different users of the um, room. And this may have implications for our uh, sleep. In um, one of our recent studies, in one of our recent field studies, we showed that variations in actual light exposure were related to earlier sleep onset and longer sleep duration. And in order to quantify variations in actual light exposure, we used the consecutive disparity index to look at the temporal variation of light exposure, because it might matter uh, how variable the light exposure is as a function of time of day, as well as the magnitude of the variations, which uh, is generally not reflected, for example, in an outer regressive parameter, as you can see uh, in the figures on this slide. So we saw that higher variations were related to earlier sleep onset and longer sleep durations, which may illustrate that when participants spend more time outdoors, they might have also experienced um, an earlier sleep onset and a longer sleep duration. But we don't know the exact uh, reason for the relationship because we don't know the exact behavior and the location of the participants throughout the uh, monitoring period. Um, 
And then just as a recap, uh, we have looked at the interrelations between light, daytime functioning and sleep. So first of all, we see that light exposure can predict alertness and vitality. It might induce changes in performance, but often those uh, effects are modest at best, at least among healthy day active participants. Light can also induce changes in our sleep-wake pattern, as you all know, via the circadian effects of light. And light is the most important time cue for our biological clock. But it might also well be that due to the fact that we close our eyes when we are sleeping and we are opening our eyes when we are awake, that this also have implications for our light exposure by our eyes is being uh, a gatekeeper for our light exposure, but also having slept very short, like I did last night, may also have implications for our light exposure. And based on our study, we see that persons may seek different strategies. So some persons are exposed to more light when they had a short night of sleep, while others are exposed to rather low intensity levels when they had a short night of sleep. So there can be substantial inter-individual differences, which is important to take into account. And maybe averaging may level out those findings as we have also seen in our study, where we looked at the average relation between sleep duration and light exposure. So I wanted to demonstrate a few examples of laboratory studies and field assessments uh, that have been run in complementary to each other, uh, where you can test effects of light under very well controlled conditions in the laboratory. Uh, but it's not always feasible to track persons over a prolonged period of time in the laboratory. And hence, field assessments might be handy. And they may also give indications in the temporal dynamics of those interrelationships and the occurrence of the findings obtained in the lab in the daily dynamics of everyday life. And the patterns detected in the field might also inform hypotheses that can be tested in the laboratory. And so I think it's very important to take such a complementary approach. So one of the main questions is what is the right light for the right person at the right time? And this may vary between persons, what is the right light? And this may also vary as a function of time of day, as well as the behavior of the participants in terms of their sleep, in terms of their movement within the building, uh, as, their, as well as their uh, levels of vitality. We may have different needs in terms of uh, light exposure profiles. And the insights in the temporal dependency may add an additional layer to the complexity of determining the right amount of light for the right person at the right time. But it may also be utilized to avoid a direct spiral in the sense that we saw that when participants uh, were exposed to more light, they felt more vital. And on the other hand, when they felt more vital, they also sought more light. Um, so in that sense, interventions might also facilitate long-term benefits. And this also strongly relates to a healthy light hygiene. And I think, uh, Manuel, you well recognize this picture, where we also uh, developed a light exposure behavior assessment questionnaire in order to get a better understanding of the type of behaviors that persons um, perform related to light exposure, as well as type of behaviors that they could perform in order to improve their light hygiene and perhaps also benefit their daytime functioning in terms of vitality as well as in terms of sleep. So I hope that this gave you insights in the type of studies that we have performed on in order to get a better understanding of the temporal dynamics in the relation between light vitality, sleep, and the complexity of those interrelationships. And um, with that, I would like to thank you for your attention and um, would be happy to answer any questions. Yeah, thank you very much, Kai, for that great talk. Um, it was great to see the dual approach of 
uh, lab studies together with uh, field studies. That was really interesting, as well as the statistical analysis that you did um, when you have to account for such uh, large inter inter individual differences as well. Um, I was wondering if you, um, in your studies, uh, field studies, did you look at chronotype? And could this have an influence on the light sort of light diet that people are exposed during the day? Because um, I imagine, depending on chronotype, people might have different behaviors um, of seeking different type of uh, light exposure at different times of the day. Yeah, so thank you for the question. I think it's a very relevant question. And, and indeed, we also monitored chronotype in our studies. Uh, I didn't present the results here, but uh, we did see differences in light profiles as a function of chronotype, where late chronotypes were exposed to less light overall, but also delayed light profiles. And I think that's also what you would expect. Um, and I think this also matched with the findings by Martin et al from 2012, where they also investigated chronotype dependent variations in light exposure. So there are a few indications and we also uh, saw that in our study that uh, the uh, light profiles are chronotype dependent, uh, but I didn't have so much statistical power to also look at those inter-individual differences because this is at the person level. And in, in this case, we have many repeated measures over time, like 12 a day for three days in a row, which but mainly allows us to particularly focus on the hour to hour and day to day variations and intercorrelations. But it would be really interesting, particularly among a larger sample, to also look at chronotype dependent moderations in um, light exposure profiles, as well as uh, vitality profiles and their interrelations. Yeah. Yeah, very interesting. So I guess in a way, possibly, if like chronotypes are exposed to less light, this could kind of reinforce you and the genetic predisposition that they have. That's very interesting. Um, yeah, so if any of the participants want to ask any questions, you can type them in the chat. I think perhaps just have maybe a couple of minutes. Um, I was also wondering about your lab, uh, lab studies, whether perhaps um, this sort of discomfort that is experienced from going from uh, cool light to um, warm light, which is not as common with the other transition, with the, it wasn't as present with the opposite transition from warm light to cool light. Um, could, could this perhaps be explained or maybe you can speculate? Um, yeah, so um, that we wouldn't see this, um, 